Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, the holiday cheer sounding a little down this year, with renewed coronavirus restrictions set to begin in Israel on the first night of Hanukkah. But meanwhile, there is good news. Israel getting unlikely support from the heart of Iran. And this, as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gets a taste of the future today. We begin this evening ripping the Band-Aid off quick. New coronavirus restrictions gearing up to take effect alongside the Hanukkah holiday this weekend. That's right. Once again, Israel recording its highest number of daily COVID cases since October 10, when second lockdowns were still in full force. The health ministry reporting at least 1,837 new cases since Monday, including Likud Knesset member David Bitan, bringing the country that much closer to a third nationwide lockdown. The total number of infected in Israel now having also risen to nearly 347,500 cases, 14,097 cases and counting actively sick, and the death toll jumping to 2,925. So what are the new rules? While still pretty shy of a full lockdown, ministers Monday evening voted to impose a nightly curfew beginning Wednesday, just before the Hanukkah holiday this Thursday, and ending after New Year's January 2nd. During curfew hours, all commercial activity will be prohibited and movement across the country will be restricted. Second, all returning Israelis from abroad and in particular from high infection countries will be required to quarantine in a designated hotel or get tested as a condition for home quarantine. Third, malls and markets will continue as they were according to the current pilot program, along with limited activity in cultural health centers like museums and galleries. Then fifth, the Green Island's local tourism plan will continue as is, as will the education system in green and yellow areas. And finally, public transportation will have maximum occupancy reduced, while fines and enforcement for violations will be increased. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying that we must make correct, determined, non-populist decisions to fight the pandemic until vaccines are ready. That, of course, in addition to following hygiene directives. <laughs> וכשאתה רואה את סוף המלחמה, לפעמים אנשים עושים טעויות, ואנשים מתים שלא לצורך, אנשים נפגעים או נפצעים. זה אותו דבר כאן. אם אנחנו לא נפעל נכון, דווקא בשעה שאנחנו רואים את הסוף, אנשים יכולים למות, ואנשים יכולים לחלות, מחלות קשות, כשאפשר למנוע את זה. Meanwhile, with respect to the vaccine plan, the first delivery of Pfizer vaccines is now reportedly set to arrive in Israel by Thursday, with some 100,000 doses being used in a pseudo-pilot to practice the delivery of vaccines within the five-day storage window. And finally, with at least 40,000 Palestinians currently in quarantine, at least four Palestinian West Bank governorates, including Hebron, Bethlehem, Nablus, and Tul Karim, will begin a week-long lockdown of their own this Thursday as well. Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Mohammed Shtaya announcing that in addition to the dozens of closed schools, all stores, save for pharmacies and groceries, will also be shuttered, and all movement between the 11 West Bank governorates will be banned. Now, ahead of the new directives, many even within the health ministry have openly criticized the curfew plan, arguing that such a mechanism is ultimately useless at containing the pandemic spread and that we may as well announce lockdowns beginning January 2nd when curfews end. So what is the point? With me to discuss is Professor Nadav Davidovich, Director of the School of Public Health at Ben Gurion University. Professor, thank you so much for being with us. Now, I'll start with the big question. What is the point of night curfews? It's an excellent question. I don't think there is a good point. Unfortunately, we don't have any good data from uh, other countries that uh, had this night curfew. Uh, I personally, together with other experts uh, in the advisory committee, we were against it. I think it's uh, maybe trying to address the problem of uh, having mass gathering during Hanukkah, but uh, you know, you cannot hit uh, with a hammer, uh, you know, a delicate uh, um, pin that you need to, to nail. Um, you need to have a much more sophisticated and uh, differentiated measure. You can work with the, the different uh, municipalities to have a Hanukkah 
uh, lighting uh, in the outside doors uh, together with kids, maybe for small groups. Um, and also, I think that uh, on the long term, this will um, create mistrust and people, you know, can go and do um, lightning at home uh, at 5 uh, p.m. before the, uh, the night curfew. And on the other hand, uh, people that want to do for jogging, why not them, uh, let them do so? Well, so, you know, is there any part of, of the new regulations or the new restrictions uh, surrounding the night curfews? Does any of that make sense to you in terms of bringing down the rate of infection? Now, we have a rise in infection. We definitely need to take uh, some uh, measures, but we need to be much smarter. Uh, and unfortunately, in the last few months, we see again and again that we are not learning, we are not taking differentiated measures. Uh, we need to be this, we need to decentralize many of our responses to give more power to the municipalities, to give more power to the civic society. And uh, now we're going to have a sensitive time with the holidays. I don't think that's the right way of approaching it. And especially, I don't understand why, if uh, we are in such a sensitive situation, why opening uh, malls is still uh, ongoing. I think we can wait uh, with opening malls. It's closed spaces uh, after the holidays. All right. Well, uh, you've given us a lot to think about. I think that we're going to have to hopefully continue to pay attention and, and abide by the larger uh, hygiene rules like uh, you know, social I, I distancing. I just want to say uh, one important uh, uh, thing that uh, today the FDA officially uh, said that uh, he thinks that uh, after reviewing, after tens of people of experts that were reviewing uh, the data that uh, the Pfizer vaccine is both safe and efficient. And I think these are excellent news, but it's going to take some time, several months. And meanwhile, we need indeed to be very uh, careful. All right, Professor Davidovich, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. All right, now, meantime, as thousands of Israelis took sick overnight, thousands of others were protesting in the streets, but not over coronavirus closures or hygiene restrictions. Rather, massive crowds in Jerusalem, including hundreds of ultra-Orthodox Jews, were clashing with police, gathering in protest against a light rail route planned to run through some of their neighborhoods. And the demonstrations started by blocking main roads in the city, knocking over fences surrounding the train's construction areas, and setting work vehicles and nearby dumpsters on fire. At least six police officers were reportedly injured, and at least 25 protesters were arrested, including some allegedly armed with knives, sticks, and pepper spray. Joining me now with more on the overnight demonstrations is Israeli police spokesperson and superintendent Mickey Rosenfeld. Mickey, thank you so much for being with us again. Now, was there a permit for the protests last night, and did it just get out of hand, or was it spontaneous to begin with? There was no permit whatsoever. What took place at the scene in Jerusalem is that uh, uh, more than 700 people gathered in the area of the Bar Ilan Junction, blocked the roads, and started uh, causing public disturbances, including throwing stones at our police officers. And it turned into a full scale riot where we both saw roads that were blocked and then trash cans that were burnt. Uh, our units responded both uh, on horses as well as on, uh, on ground. And uh, unfortunately, there were six police officers that were injured. Two of them were taken to hospital for treatment. And altogether, we arrested more than 25 people that were involved in the disturbances that continued, in fact, throughout the evening and uh, towards the night. Now, I know we just mentioned that there wasn't a permit uh, for, for these demonstrations. However, you know, the 25 arrests, is this like a loud minority that's, you know, rabble rousing, so to speak, or, or you know, were they really just part of a larger a whole? Every individual that was arrested at the scene was involved in yesterday's disturbances that unfortunately including attacking police officers. That is unacceptable. And when the law is broken, our units have to respond at the scene. We know that the background to that demonstration was the right railway, which is scheduled to be uh, uh, worked and built upon in that area. But uh, the uh, demonstrations that got out of hand by the residents that were in the area, uh, that is something that we responded to. It was absolutely unnecessary. And of course, in any case where there are uh, disturbances that take place in the different neighborhoods in Jerusalem, for whatever reasons, our units, both our border police units, as well as our regular 
special patrol units respond to those types of incidents. All right. Well, now we, I understand that obviously the train is still going to be constructed. Uh, how, how are you planning or is the police planning to handle the situation going forward, assuming that there will be more demonstrations? That's correct. First of all, there's no changes in terms of the strategic planning in Jerusalem. The light railway is scheduled to go through that area. And if necessary, our police units will respond to any types of incidents or illegal demonstrations. If people want to demonstrate in Jerusalem, they can ask for a permit and it can be organized and coordinated with the Israeli National Police uh, within any sector, whether it's the Jewish sector, the Muslim sector or the Christian sector or anywhere apart, any parts of Jerusalem. But uh, what happened yesterday specifically is something that we can respond to if necessary. And also tonight in Jerusalem, there'll be extra patrols and extra units in the different ultra-religious neighborhoods. All right, Superintendent Mickey Rosenfeld, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Moving on, a feeling of deja vu in the international community as the United Nations General Assembly convened Monday evening to discuss, quote, the risk of nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. But why deja vu? Well, because, of course, what should a resolution with such a widely scoped title focus on, apart from calling on Israel exclusively to renounce its alleged possession of nuclear weapons and sign the UN's Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? And in a vote of 153 to 6, with 25 abstentions, the international community overwhelmingly supports this resolution, co-sponsored by the Palestinian Authority, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UAE. Those voting against it, including Canada, the United States, Israel, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau. Meanwhile, in a separate vote, the UNGA also voted 174 to 2 on a resolution calling for a nuclear-free zone in the Middle East, again with a focus on Israel and with only Israel and the United States opposing. These resolutions, as part of the nearly 20 anti-Israel texts passed annually in the General Assembly, and at any rate, it's widely assumed that Israel is among the nine known nuclear powers in the world. But Israel has never confirmed nor denied its nuclear capabilities, and it remains one of the few nations not to have signed the UN's non-proliferation treaty. In other news, while the UNGA swings the axe, support for Israel is coming from unlikely places. Pictures and video of an Israeli flag and a banner reading, Thank you, Mossad, seen hanging on a bridge in Tehran going viral overnight. Now, those responsible for the sign remain unidentified, but Iranian law bans the use of Israeli flags, symbols, or signs while often jailing or even executing anti-state protesters. So that makes sense. Still, right there in the Iranian capital, someone or several someones felt brave enough to reach out to the international community, taking care to write the sign in English and seemingly in reference to the recent alleged Mossad assassination of top Iranian nuclear official Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. Speaking of Iran... On top of the growing number of crises in the country, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei has now reportedly fallen ill. Sources within Iran's government allegedly very concerned over the 81-year-old's apparently deteriorating condition. So what does the future hold for Iran and subsequently the region? With the answers is IDF Reserves Major Daniel Pfefferman, advisor and analyst for foreign policy and national security. Now, Dan, thank you so much for being with us. You know, most power has been now transferred to Khamenei's son. Is that a sustainable solution? Hi, uh, thank you for having me on the show. Um, so the power for now reportedly has been transferred to his uh, son, Mojtaba uh, Khamenei. Um, it's not, it's, it's an interim solution. Um, I think the reports that uh, he cannot uh, continue, um, the Supreme Leader cannot continue in his role or that he might even be dying are premature. They could be opposition reports. Um, they, they don't seem to be uh, backed up by anything we're seeing in the, you know, traditional dynamics um, within Iran. Um, but going forward, um, it's not clear who's going to be the successor for Khamenei. Um, and hard to see, uh, not impossible, but difficult to see a situation where Mojtaba, uh, the son, takes over. Well, so, so you know, I, I guess, you know, what happens in the event of the Ayatollah's death? Because I understand that there is a law against succession. Right. Uh, there's a law against succession, and it's also something that's frowned upon um, in Iran, in Iranian culture and uh, society. Uh, even if you go back to the days of the Shah, part of the uh, reason that uh, one of the reasons that the Shah was overthrown uh, popularly was because uh, uh, of the succession of his son. So it's not something that is um, acceptable completely. It doesn't make it impossible, but it's not something that acceptable in Iranian society, 
even today, even in their model of uh, in their uh, theocratic autocratic type regime. Um, what traditionally happens is the Council of, uh, of Experts, uh, I forget the exact name, the Council of Experts, an 88-person council of clerics, um, has to get together and uh, decide on a successor. And in the meantime, you have an interim government that consists of the president um, the, and the, the chief judiciary um, and, and other senior figures who come together to rule in the interim. Um, and Mojtaba has been one of the names that we've seen over the years as the possible uh, successor, but he's not a popular figure. He's also not an elected figure. He's also not a very public figure. His role in the regime is, is really um, uh, one of trust. Uh, he's often referred to as the gatekeeper to uh, his father, to Khamenei. Um, he's got very close ties in the IRGC and in the intelligence apparatuses and is often seen as... Um, I don't want to say henchman, but but kind of someone who, behind the scenes, does uh, the dirty work that needs to to be done in order to uh, to keep the father in power and to keep uh, kind of all the, um, the cogs of the Iranian regime uh, operating. Well, it seems like we have uh, a lot to pay close attention to in Iran then to see whether or not this is fake news, as you said, and and what comes from it. Major Pfefferman, thank you very much for being with us. Pleasure. Moving on, Israeli collaboration with the United States is also now set for a minor potential change in dynamics as more and more of President-elect Biden's cabinet is filled out. Here with more is founder and president of the Jerusalem Washington Center, Gideon Israel. Gideon, all right, so, you know, let's start. What is the current strategy for the Middle East from what's been reported uh, and from what we know about Biden's recent picks? Well, Biden's two major picks for uh, on foreign policy is uh, national security advisor to be uh, Jake Sullivan and Secretary of State Antony Blinken. And Blinken has been praised in the Israeli diplomatic world as someone who's very sensitive to Israel's needs. But I think beyond, um, you know, what statements that these, uh, you know, that have been made about these, that, about these two people, what's important is what is their strategic outlook? Because, because based on that, their strategic outlook, that's what's going to determine the strength of the U.S. Israel relationship. Now, both have talked about uh, the need to re-enter the Iran deal. Israel is, is against the Iran deal and thinks that's detrimental uh, for its security. Both have looked to put uh, the Palestinian issue at the forefront, something that Israel sees as... Uh, you know, Israel does. Israel sees the Palestinian issue as a fringe issue in the Middle East, at least most of the Israeli government. And and another thing is that these that that these people also see human rights issues as very important issues throughout the Middle East, which which could endanger America's relationship with Saudi Arabia and Egypt. So if if they pursue this agenda, Blinken and Sullivan, this does not bode well for Israel and the strength of the U.S. Israel relationship. All right. So you know, but. I have to say, you know, do you see any any changes from the from the United States with respect to, I don't know, its its balance of of its relationship between Israel and the Palestinians? Well, well, I mean, well, I mean, certainly that certainly the. Um, Cause, I mean, because you're describing a lot of disagreements that we're having, but I'm not necessarily sure. You know, how does that translate to to? Well, uh, well, obviously, obviously, uh, the United States is going to restore funding to Pal to the Palestinian Authority across the board. The Palestinian delegation in Washington D.C. will will be reopened, um, and but but beyond but beyond even these changes, what's I think more, of more concern for for Israel and supporters of Israel in this administration is is those people who let's say will be at second tier positions. One example is this woman named uh, Rima Dodin, who's going to be the deputy director. For legislative affairs in the White House, she's going to she's going to be the one liaising with Congress on on legislation for the administration, and this she's a uh, she's a Palestinian, but she ha she's also regularly in contact with CARE. While she was at UC Berkeley, she legitimized or rationalized Palestinian suicide suicide bombings. So so it's this type of person that is going to be making policy and bringing policy ideas up to the up to the top tier uh, positions and and this is and and also these these type of people move on as the administration as the administration progresses so 
what, what the Biden administration will do is facilitate a lot of these type of people from the hard left to be in positions of prominence but in the administration. Is, but is there a chance that maybe, you know, some of the more moderate voices in the administration and within Congress might, you know, soften their stances? Or do you think that it'll be the other way around, that some of the more extreme voices will be given new, you know, life? Well, if, if, the Repub if the Republicans are controlling the Senate, then for the administration to pass any types of legislation, they're going to have to negotiate with, with the Republicans. So that will certainly moderate um, any type of uh, anti-Israel legislation or legislation that Israel considers dangerous coming out of the White House. But, um, but there are many things that the administration can do on a day-to-day -day level that can be very harmful to Israel. It doesn't necessarily go up to the president of the United States. So I think there's uh, certainly reason for concern among uh, Israel and supporters of Israel. Okay, in Israel, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And now in our final story this evening, get ready to taste the future as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu becomes the first known world leader to eat cultured, cruelty-free meat. Hannah Rifkin reporting. <laughs> And just like that, with one taste, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu became the first world leader known to eat and get hooked on meat grown in a lab. And the premier getting a taste for the future meat industry in this landmark visit to Olive Farms where the incredible technology is being developed. And in fact, the technology really does have the ability to change Israel and soon the world. Olive Farms Associates explaining the potential. קופסאות עם הרבה מאוד מבחנות, בכל מבחנה יש כמה מיליונים של תאים ובמבחנה כזאת היא בעצם שאנחנו רואים כאן אנחנו עושים את זה וזה גם לחסוך המון זיהום, המון סבל, בסופו של דבר להוריד את המחיר ולייצר תעשייה חדשה על האנושות ולתת לאנשים את הברירה בדיוק לפעמים אין ברירה, אבל כשיש לך את הברירה ומייצרים כאן את הברירה זה דבר מאוד מאוד משמעותי לדעתי and now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be cloudy again with lows dropping to an average of 55 Fahrenheit or 13 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect partly cloudy skies and rain, but with a slight rise in temperatures to an average of 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. She go into and she twerk, twerk. She go into and she twerk, twerk. She go into and she twerk. Sorry, you turned. <laughs> Uh, I love how dogs get excited about everything. It's just the best. That is it for today's news, though. Today's exchange rate is 3.25 shekels for the American dollar and 2.54 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>